Hey, it's Karen. Welcome to this episode of A Touch of Genius, your place to get curious about your personal ingenuity and develop your potential. Together, we're going to discover how to break down and break through limitations so we can shine brighter. We'll find out how this helps us create a better life experience wherever we are and explore its far-reaching implications. We'll also be learning more about how someone else's touch of genius impacts us. Get your notebook and cookies ready, and let's dive into this episode. Hello, geniuses. How are you? I was talking to a friend's teenage son the other day who told me that in his computer sciences class, they had been studying the history of computers. I remember back in the day when I had computer class, we were learning how to use simple code called logo in order to make a turtle move from one side of the screen to the other. Who here remembers doing that too? Playing with Logo was pretty cool, and an unbeknownst precursor of what would become my first career. I was fascinated by how that computer device worked inside, though. How is it possible that all of what I saw happening on the screen came down to a sequence of ones and zeros? How could that alone operate the machine itself, registering my keystrokes and then assigning the pixels that would light up on the monitor and show me the result of what I was typing in? Do you ever stop to think about something like that? instead of just taking for granted that it does it all by itself. But we're not here to talk about computers. We're going to get curious about our own personal computer, our magnificent brain, and how we can program it to develop our potential. We're going to find out if we can program genius. Do you ever stop to think about how your brain works? How does it handle all your core bodily functions like blinking and breathing, whilst also handling more conscious functions like typing, driving, thinking out strategies, playing an instrument, listening to someone, or handling heavy machinery. We have so many programs running within the brain at once that it's quite the miracle machine, isn't it? We'll also talk about this in two aspects, so we'll be jumping back and forth between them, the brain and the mind. Think of the brain as being the physical hardware and the mind as being the software that runs it. Both need to be taken care of, because if not, we are not functioning at our best. Now, which came first, the brain or the thought? Ooh, that was a good one. Maybe I should end the episode right here. Just kidding. Bet it got you thinking, though. Do you understand how your mind is set up to function? You've probably seen those images presenting the mind like it's an iceberg. That tiny peak that sticks out of the water is the conscious part of your mind, and the mega chunk that lies below the waterline is the subconscious part, which drives practically everything, right down to how often you blink and breathe and what you choose to have for breakfast. This is where all our beliefs, attitudes, and values are packed in. The things that drive our actions, behaviors, and results. We think we live through our conscious mind, but it's the big chunk of the subconscious mind that's hidden under the imaginary waterline that really controls what's going on. Which is why when we reach a point where we hit the proverbial iceberg like the Titanic did, we're actually crashing into our own beliefs. During our core development phase of up to about six years old is where we take in crucial information from our surroundings. This is what starts to inform our own belief system, our attitudes, and eventually our values. If we're not encouraged to have a positive attitude to explore our curiosity and develop our skills with, then it's no surprise if we don't do just that. If we keep hearing our parents caution us about how dangerous the world is, it's not surprising that many people choose to stay within their town and never leave. If you keep hearing that somebody met an untimely death or harsh repercussions because they acted differently from all the rest, it may condition you to stay within the box of societal norms and not develop your talents or ideas. So, with the mind covered, let's talk about the brain. As we already know, the human brain is split into two hemispheres, right and left. These are joined together by a bundle of nerve fibers located in the middle of the brain. The left hemisphere of the brain controls the right-hand side of the body. It receives information from the right visual field. It controls speech, language, and recognition of words, letters, and numbers. The right hemisphere controls the left-hand side of the body. It receives information from the left visual field, and it controls creativity, context, and recognition of faces, places, and things. Over the years, scientists have realized that there is some crossover even if one side of the brain is still predominantly in charge of certain functions. The nervous system is our body's command center. It's made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and nerves. The nervous system works by sending electric signals between your brain and all the other parts of your body. Neurons are considered the basic units of the nervous system. It's estimated that we have around 86 billion neurons in the brain. 
Each one is connected to another thousand neurons, creating an incredibly complex network of communication, or pathways as we often call them. They make up around 10% of the brain. The rest is made up of non-neuronal cells and astrocytes that support and nourish neurons. That's our brain's hardware in a nutshell. Now, from an emotional aspect, the right side of the body is identified with the masculine and traits such as assertiveness, aggressiveness, and authoritarianism. The left side is considered feminine, and the traits that are associated with it are emotionality, passivity, creative thought, and holistic expression. Which means we are both and one at the same time. But we'll talk about masculine and feminine energies and emotions and their implications in another episode. Today we're focusing on the wiring of the brain and the impact of the mind. When it comes to our development in relation to the brain, here are two statements you will often hear. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Both statements are valid in their own ways, and the latter can be changed by the first. Because when we put our minds to something, that is, consciously think about something, we can literally rewire our brains by building new neurological connections. Meaning, when we consciously upgrade our software, it impacts our hardware. In our case, we can do it better than a computer because we can grow our own neurological pathways. A computer will only ever be able to handle information based on the hardware it has available, and if this gets obsolete, you can't upgrade any programs. We can constantly upgrade ourselves. Advantage point, human beings. Knowing this, consider the changes you could make in your own body and life just by consciously developing your own neurological pathways. I mean, you've already done this during your early formative years, so why stop now? Why let certain beliefs hold you back from learning that new language, skill, sport, or artistic interest? Who decided anyway that after a certain age, one couldn't do such things? Neuroplasticity now shows us that we can constantly grow and reimagine our own brains. We are essentially our own miracle machines, whether it's for self-healing or self-development or both. So let's use our best tool to our advantage. I'm never going to get tired of asking you to ask yourself why you think what you think. Not for you to get defensive about it or to imply that anything may be wrong about it, but for you to challenge yourself in a healthy way, especially if you keep struggling with similar issues over and over. This is about overcoming ourselves when we know and feel that we can be living more fully. Many of our geniuses have had to chew over things millions of times in their minds before they found a solution. How do you think this literally helped them grow their own neurological pathways for a higher brain function? So how could this affect your personal ingenuity? The possibilities are infinite. You choose. You don't have to become the next Nikola Tesla, although you could if you want to. The excitement of this lies purely within what you envision for yourself and what makes you happy. So, what if you could program yourself to live, feel, think, and be better? Would that please you? The thing is, if we're not changing, we risk becoming obsolete. This applies in our career, in our relationships, in our spirituality, and our own bodies. In Spanish, we have a saying, renovarse o morir, which translates to renew or die. Yes, it's a bit dramatic, but it gets the point across, doesn't it? This is why when I hear people say they're not going to change, I wonder if they realize how they're limiting themselves. They'll usually say this when it relates to being of a certain age, or other people wanting them to behave differently, but because the message they are adamantly hammering into their subconscious mind is, I'm not going to change, and because our subconscious mind is primed to be our servant, it faithfully delivers the very thing that we tell it to deliver to us. That's why you find many people frustrated with themselves. They don't realize how they're blocking themselves from their own progress over seemingly innocuous comments like this. That's when they typically say, oh, but I didn't mean it that way. But the subconscious mind didn't know the difference. It just received an instruction, and it's following that instruction. They may consciously mean it one way, but the subconscious mind takes it in as law for everything. So, if the mind feeds the hardware, then what does that sort of thought do to the hardware itself? If we're impacting the hardware in a positive way, it will thrive. But if we aren't doing that, then it's kind of like letting something that's made of iron oxidize by keeping it outside in the rain. Those are the conditions by which it will rust. What are the mental conditions by which you might be making your own brain get rusty? People love to talk about how we've progressed over the last hundred years, but I'm on the fence about that. Our technology seems to have progressed, but humanity itself? 
How have we truly developed our intuition, our spirituality, our heartfelt connection with one another, our highest intelligence? Yes, we have lots of cool tools and toys, but we ourselves have a lot of work to do, which those tools don't actually help us with. The point of human development is to look within and develop from there. Science and technology can provide some tools to help us study or monitor our human development, especially when it comes to how the mind impacts the brain and body. This can be interesting when it is not invasive and we get to maintain the sovereignty of our brain. But if we rely too much on technology, then we run the risk of overriding our intuition over how to develop ourselves naturally, not to mention our own memory building skills. Let's not fry our brains with all that tech, please. Personally, I'm not keen on chips and stuff being implanted in people, especially when it comes to the brain. Instead of becoming bionic creatures, which is just not interesting to me at all, why not continue to explore our human development further by the most natural means available to us? One thing is helping somebody who's lost a limb walk or use an arm again. The other is planting stuff inside the brain to potentially drive a person's behavior. Perhaps you like that idea, but here we're going to focus on how to develop our capacities ourselves. After all, our greatest minds didn't use brain implants, did they? And look at how prolific they were in their inventions, creations, and ideas. So if they could do it, why not us? And why not do it naturally? If we think of genius as being the best performing version of ourselves, then there is nothing to say that we can't program ourselves for genius to happen through us. It's a matter of choice, focus, and discipline. After all, how do you get good at something? By doing it consistently, right? And by somehow monitoring your own progress, whether it's through note-taking, Excel sheets, or some other tracking tool. For this, technology can be useful, although a simple pen and paper can be just as useful too. In sales and marketing, you often hear the phrase, you can't manage what you can't measure, which is why we have so many different platforms to measure statistics, sales, and all that jazz. But people aren't used to measuring their own progress on more personal things, especially when it comes to their interests, talents, or mental state. They just dive into something and get stuck into it, whether it's learning a sport, playing an instrument, or painting. And there is great value in simply doing such a thing because you love it and you enjoy it. However, when we want to develop our potential, we do need some sort of before and after measuring tools in place so that we can get a better sense of our progress, which helps develop confidence. If you're learning to play an instrument, the measuring tool is not just how many songs you can play or how long it takes you to learn each one. It's also your posture, your technique, the emotion you put into it, and your ability to concentrate or play accompanied, for example. These are all micro-measurements within the overall package of learning to play an instrument. The same happens in sport, in business, and even in relationships. If it's a behavioral change, then you need to know how you're behaving now and how you would like to behave instead. How can you break that down into measurable actions that will help you develop and maintain the new behavior? What will that new behavior help you with in terms of self-esteem, self-confidence, in your relationships and in what you do? Does it require changing beliefs or prior decisions that you made? This is where we get to be mental and emotional scientists with ourselves. What happens when we fall off the bandwagon of change, and how do we recover personal integrity if so? I'm not saying to become obsessive about measuring everything. This is about you learning to hone in on your best self and finding where you can improve. It's for you to feel that you are going beyond your regular survival needs and scaling up your Maslow's hierarchy of needs to that place of self-actualization so that you can go to sleep at night feeling fulfilled more often than not. This is why curiosity is key for us to explore our thinking and reprogramming ourselves, with or without additional support. Just as with anything else, quite often we need someone who knows how to do this to help us overcome our blind spots or simply gain new information that we can integrate with what we already know. This brings us to Ada Lovelace, our genius of the day. Lovelace is considered to be the first computer programmer. Even though she wrote about a computer called the Analytical Engine, she realized that the computer could follow a series of simple instructions to perform a complex calculation. Lovelace was the daughter of famed poet Lord Byron and Annabella Milbank Byron, who legally separated two months after her birth. Her father then left the country, and she never knew him personally because he died when she was eight years old. Lovelace was educated privately by tutors and then self-educated, but was helped in her advanced studies by Augustus de Morgan, the first professor of mathematics at the University of London. By the time she reached her late teens, she was actually more interested in talking to scientists and mathematicians than potential suitors from England's elite. She became interested in Charles Babbage's machines when she was introduced to him by a mutual friend. Babbage was an English mathematician and inventor who is credited with having conceived the first automatic digital computer. Lovelace's vision for the device went far beyond just the ability to calculate complex equations. 
She contended that anything that could be represented by numbers, like musical notes and letters, could also be manipulated by such machines. Her mathematical intellect paired with her creativity allowed her to envision an abstract field that came to be known as computing. She called her own work poetical science. Lovelace died at 36 years old, and she never saw the analytical engine completed, because the machine itself was never completed. Well over 100 years after she wrote the first computer program, though, a computing language that is used worldwide was named Ada in her honor. Speaking of computing languages, if this, then that, is a typical line of code that you have in programming. It creates different results based on different variables. Our mind functions the same way. Example, if I sense danger, then I will protect myself. If this action creates a positive response, then I will continue doing that action, and so on and so forth. So if we take a step back and study our own operating commands, we will get a glimpse of where our own internal programming is being successful or pleasing to us, and where it isn't. Once we have that information, we can look for variables to work with that will provide a more satisfying set of results. Simple example, if I go to sleep late at night, then I wake up tired. So what if I go to sleep earlier? You change the variable. Sometimes we get stuck in a loop. This is where other factors come into play, based on our internal strategies, memories, and belief systems. You see, we have strategies for everything in life, right down to how we make our cup of coffee amidst all of our other morning routines. We have strategies for love, for finance, for health, for spirituality, for making ourselves feel good, or making ourselves feel bad. The list is endless. If you're always running late or highly distracted about things, there's a strategy in there somewhere too. All it requires is awareness and clarity on what a better strategy can be, then learn to implement it. So, let's get interactive. The following exercise is available as a PDF download from the show notes or its episode page on my website, karenpinter.com forward slash podcast. Here it goes. Write down or think about how your day goes, right from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep and the lights are out. What do you do and how do you do it? Are you happy with your own flow or is there something you'd like to improve? If so, what is it? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the strongest, how important is it for you to change this? If it scores low, then perhaps there's something else you ought to be looking at instead. Go back to the first question, then carry on. Unpack how that might be causing issues. Write down current if-then scenarios. For example, if I wake up late, then I end up scrambling to get myself out the door and wind up stressed. Now think of what you would like to experience instead. Write a desired scenario. For example, if I wake up on time or earlier, then I leave the house well organized and feeling good about myself. Do you see how we're integrating emotional results into this as well? What kinds of thoughts and feelings come up when you think about making this change? Do you think you can or do you think you can't? We're really good at creating excuses so as not to experience the discomfort of change, even when we know we would be better off making that change. How would you like to feel instead? What will you gain or lose in a positive way? from changing this one thing. You can also use the exercise from episode 1 as an extra support for your desired outcome, also downloadable from that episode's show notes or my website. This is purely an exercise in optimization. You can obviously choose different aspects of your life to optimize, creating a compound effect for your personal development. With this exercise, we've essentially looked at some of our programming and explored how to change it. The bigger the changes we want to make and the deeper we go into our belief systems, the more this will require us to look at some deeper, hardwired thought processes and their associated emotions. But you've got one tool now to get you started if you've never done this sort of thing before. You can also share this with your kids who are maybe in a preteen or already teenagers, because this will help them refine part of their own processes, especially when they're studying. Again, to scale up Maslow's hierarchy of needs in search of self-actualization or our personal genius, it helps that we reduce or optimize the things that can slow us down. We can't ascend easily if we're bogged down with too many things that keep us drained or distracted from accessing higher thought, higher energy levels, and therefore a higher existence. If you've been following this podcast since the beginning, you may begin to see a pattern emerge to help you build on the previous content. If you just arrived at this episode, welcome, and I would encourage you to listen to the first episodes to get up to speed. There are cookies involved if you like cookies. Bear in mind, all along we've been talking about this in terms of a whole brain, but what if you literally only had half a brain? 
One of my favorite books on the subject of brain development is The Brain That Heals Itself, written by Norman Doidge, who is a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, researcher, author, essayist, and poet. In this book, he explores neuroplasticity through the different ways scientists and neurologists have helped people develop brain functions, sometimes against all odds. It's a fascinating read. Imagine a woman who was born with only the right hemisphere of her brain. By all accounts, this should have condemned her to a life of not being able to use the other half of her brain for its core functions and also experience severely limited physical abilities. With the right help, which took a while because she had been misdiagnosed at one point with having cerebral palsy, which a later CAT scan of her brain revealed that she didn't have, she was able to override many of those issues with the hemisphere that she does have. Her right brain learned to balance out its regular functions to incorporate the ones the other hemisphere would have normally taken care of. This did mean reducing some of its own functions, which did affect her in some ways, but she's still a very capable human being as it is. Some things to highlight are that she has a superior memory for concrete details, but has difficulty with abstract thought. She has savant-like qualities when it comes to calculating numbers. She achieved this with no chips or implants in her brain, just a good study of her neurological pathways to understand what was going on in her brain and techniques to help her develop herself further, despite what she had. There are many other fascinating stories in this book, which I remember buying at Waterstones in Hampstead, London. It was the only copy they had that was sitting on a table surrounded by piles of other books, and something called for me to pick it up and buy it. Do you have such memories of where you were when you bought a certain book? By the way, if you're ever in the Hampstead area, there's also a delightful Hungarian patisserie close by that I visit whenever I can. I think you may begin to see another pattern emerge here that I very much enjoy pastry shops. Shh, don't tell anyone. Another thing that I enjoy is deepening my understanding of the mind and its implications on our body. Did you know that something as simple as which hand we write with can physically affect another part of the body? Here's another real-life example. Somebody I know personally once told me that she used to stutter as a child. This problem was resolved by the chance discovery that if she wrote with her left hand instead of with her right, the speech issue went away. She was raised at a time when people forced those who were naturally left-handed to switch hands to write with. In her case, and perhaps that of many others, instead of being allowed to honor her natural inclination to use her left hand, the forced use of her right hand tripped something in her brain that caused the speech impediment. This goes to show that we can literally create a system malfunction within ourselves, just like when a computer freezes up. We too can freeze up if we're not respecting our own natural internal processes, or if something gets emotionally blocked somehow. This is just one example of many physical issues that could be resolved by following this sort of curiosity instead of immediately jumping to conclusions and mislabeling an issue, or going in for surgeries, or years of speech therapy, or other related therapies, and the emotional stress that it creates for everyone involved. Think as well, at the emotional level, how this could create a so-called split in someone's personality in which they are fighting against themselves, but they don't even remember why, because the change was so deeply installed long ago and it's never occurred to anyone to look at the issue differently. Please note, I'm not a doctor, so this information is purely intended to encourage your curiosity and ask other specialists about what other options and possibilities exist for any physical or severe psychological issues that you may be encountering. End of disclaimer. I think it's important that we understand more about how our brain works in tandem with our thoughts and emotions. Our brain is a constantly evolving organ that we get to instruct on how to perform better for us. We can program it to our liking, which means we can also deprogram the things that are limiting us from experiencing our personal genius. It's like understanding how a car works. If you don't know the essentials, how would you even know how to use it? On that note, it's time to get into the driver's seat of your life. As we wrap up today's show, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. It means a lot to me. You see, Whenever we create something, we always take a leap of faith into the unknown, and we don't always know how it'll work out. That's part of what this podcast is about, encouraging all of us to take leaps of faith on our ideas, dreams, and creations, and having a safe space to explore them, to build the strength to get back up when we fall, and to celebrate when we fly high. I'd love to know what your big takeaway is from this episode. Tell me what you're working through and what you'd like to know more about. Also, is there someone you'd like me to interview on the topic of genius? Let me know. Email me at hello at karenpinter.com or message me on my socials. In the meantime, take care of your genius self.